Georgi Dimitrov, The Soviet Union and the Working Class of the Capitalist Countries 1. Unbounded are the joy and enthusiasm with which the millions of working people throughout the world, all fighters against capitalist spoliation, fascist barbarism and imperialist war, greet the 20th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. Honest supporters of democracy, progress and peace, the best people of science, culture and art, in all countries, greet the 20th anniversary of the existence of the first socialist state in the world as an event of world historic importance. No other event in the history of mankind has had such tremendous influence over the entire course of social development, over the fate of all the peoples of the earth, as the victory of the great October Socialist Revolution. There has not been hitherto such a state as the USSR, which millions of people in all corners of the globe, regardless of nationality or race, love as their own fatherland, and with which they feel themselves, their lives, their fate and their hopes virtually bound up. As a result of the bourgeois revolutions, capitalism defeated the feudal system and won a dominating position. It encircled the entire world in its system of economy, overcame feudal particularism, and established big national states. But capitalism merely replaced one form of exploitation by another, class antagonisms of one kind by another. It could not unite the peoples in peaceful fraternity. It deepened the gulf between them, creating new international contradictions and new causes of destructive wars of conquest. As a result of the Great October Socialist Revolution, socialism was victorious over capitalism on one-sixth of the globe. A powerful socialist state rose up in a tremendous territory covering half of Europe and Asia, in the heart of the world, a state based on the abolition of the exploitation of man by man and on a fraternal alliance among the peoples, and showing the way to the liberation of mankind from the bondage of capitalism to the unification of all the peoples of the earth in a supreme fraternity of free and happy working people. In the course of twenty years of severe struggle, in the face of the furious resistance of the defeated exploited classes within the country and counter-revolutionary intervention from without, in conditions of encirclement by the hostile capitalist powers, the working people of the USSR, led by their glorious party of Bolsheviks, headed by the brilliant leaders of working mankind, Lenin and Stalin, transformed a backward, wretched country into a foremost powerful socialist state. Whereas in 1913, Lenin, in characterizing the unbelievable backwardness of Tsarist Russia, pointed out that as regards modern means of production, the country's economy was four times behind England, five times behind Germany, and ten times behind America. Today, the Soviet Union occupies first place in Europe and second place in the world as an industrial country as regards the output of industrial production. No one can deny the enormous achievements of socialist construction, the tremendous growth of industry and the record harvests of collectivized agriculture. It is a fact, is it not, that such a stormy advance of economic development has taken place in the USSR as has never been known by capitalist society. Whereas the development of industry of the capitalist countries during the period 1890 to 1913 showed an average growth in production of 5.8% a year, and during the period 1913 to 1936 only 1.5%, in the Soviet Union in 1936 alone the growth of industrial output totaled 28%. Whereas in 1936 the industrial output of capitalist countries exceeded the 1913 level by one-third, in the Soviet Union it increased by more than seven times. In the sphere of agriculture, a great historical victory has been achieved. At the time when the agriculture of capitalist countries is not emerging from the protracted agrarian crisis, as the result of which the sown area is decreasing, a great number of products being destroyed, and the level of all production steadily lowering, in the Soviet Union, in place of a backward, scattered economy, there has been created the most advanced and biggest socialist agriculture, with 99% of the area sown by the peasants collectivized. Thanks to the collective farm order, 
poverty in the village has been destroyed, and there are no longer peasants who have no land, no horses, no implements. More than 20 million poor peasants, who formerly lived a poverty-stricken existence, have joined the collective farms, and are today leading a well-to-do, cultured life. Socialist agriculture is yielding record harvests, unprecedented in the history of the country. In 1937, there was harvested nearly 7 billion puts of grain, while the best years before the revolution gave 4 to 5 billion puts. Under capitalism, wherever there is an increase of the wealth of the few, there is an increase at the other end of the pole, of poverty and misery for millions of working people. The boom periods are inevitably followed by severe crisis, which destroy the productive forces and bring in their train unemployment, hunger and poverty. The socialist system, on the other hand, does not know of crisis, does not know of unemployment and poverty. Irrefutable facts clearly testify to the superiority of the socialist system over the capitalist system, not only in the sphere of economics, but also in the sphere of everyday life and culture, science and art, in the sphere of the relations between the peoples. Only the bought apologists of capitalism can dispute this superiority, and only hopeless cretins who not infrequently call themselves socialists and political charlatans who distort Marxism venture still to prove that the working class is incapable of undertaking the historic responsibility of guiding the fate of its own people and of the organization of the national economy, that the proletariat which is, quote-unquote, inexperienced in the state and economic affairs, cannot get on without the bourgeoisie who are, quote-unquote, experienced in these affairs. Twenty years of the existence of the Soviet Union provide splendid confirmation of the words of Comrade Stalin, uttered in 1927 on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the October Revolution. Quote, Undoubted successes of socialism in the USSR on the front of construction have clearly shown that the proletariat can successfully govern the country without the bourgeoisie and against the bourgeoisie, that it can successfully build up industry without the bourgeoisie and against the bourgeoisie, that it can successfully guide the whole of the national economy without the bourgeoisie and against the bourgeoisie, that it can successfully build socialism despite the encirclement of the capitalist state. Unquote. Joseph Stalin, Problems of Leninism, Pages 204 to 5, Russian edition. Herein lies one of the most important lessons of principle of the great October Socialist Revolution for the working class of the capitalist countries, a lesson which needs to be particularly underlined on the occasion of the 20th anniversary. 2. Much has been done by the proletariat of the capitalist countries in supporting the first proletarian revolution in the history of mankind. Had it not been for this support, the Soviet workers and peasants would have shed their blood to a still greater degree and would have had to sacrifice still more in order to defend the gains of the socialist revolution. Nevertheless, however, it must be said outright that the working classes of the capitalist countries have not succeeded in thoroughly fulfilling either their duty toward the first socialist revolution or toward their own liberation. Not only have they remained under the power of capital and in Italy and Germany have fallen victims to the barbarous bondage of fascism, but they have involuntarily assisted in increasing the difficulties, privations, sufferings and sacrifices of the vanguard unit of the international proletariat. But what would the world have looked like if the proletariat of Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy after the October Revolution in the period of 1918 to 1920 had not stopped halfway in their revolutionary advance. What would the world have looked like had the German and Austrian revolutions of 1918 been carried through to the end, and had the dictatorship of the proletariat been established in the heart of Europe, in highly developed industrial countries, as a result of the victory of the revolution? A revolutionary bloc of the West European proletariat and the working class of the Soviet Union would not only have facilitated a hundredfold the liquidation of the counter-revolutionary intervention and civil war, but would have immeasurably hastened on the building of socialism in the land of the Soviets. The fascist dictatorships would not have existed either in Italy, Germany, Austria or other countries. 
there would have been no offensive of fascism upon the working class and the democratic peoples. There would not have been the present difficult trials of the Spanish and Chinese peoples. Mankind would not now be faced with the ominous menace of a new world slaughter. At the time when the Russian workers and peasants overthrew the landlords and capitalists, all the necessary objective conditions were at hand in Central Europe for the European, and particularly the German proletariat, taking the path of the Soviet workers and peasants. But this did not take place. It did not take place mainly because the decisive word at that time in the leadership of the mass organizations of the proletariat belonged to the leaders of the social democratic parties, who had been in coalition with their own imperialist bourgeoisie from the outbreak of the war. In their effort at all cost to preserve the shattered foundations of bourgeois society, they widely utilized the influence of the ideology and policy of social democratism, reformism, in order to deceive the majority of the working class by spreading the conviction among them that the workers would be led to socialism not by the further development of the revolution, but by its rapid liquidation. By their coalition with the bourgeoisie, they split the working class movement, weakened the proletariat, isolated it from the peasantry and the small townspeople, and thus helped the bourgeoisie to gather their forces and to undertake the offensive against the revolutionary workers and peasants. The political cowards and deceivers of the proletariat who were at the head of the mass organizations of the working class alarmed the workers with the prospects of sacrifices, privation and economic ruin. They assured them that they would be led to socialism not by the path of Bolshevism, by the revolutionary practical application of the teachings of Marx and Engels, not by the proletarian revolution and the dictatorship of the proletariat, but that a peaceful and painless transition to socialism would be ensured by the path of social democratism, the path of coalition with the bourgeoisie, and the preservation of the bourgeois system. Now the results of the twenty years are before us. Who will deny that the sacrifices and privations borne, for instance by the working class and working masses of Germany throughout the whole of the post-war period, and particularly in the conditions of the savage regime of the fascist dictatorship, are a thousand times greater than all the possible sacrifices and privations that would have been demanded by the victory of the proletarian revolution in 1918. Instead of the promised peaceful, painless transition to socialism, social democratism, by its entire capitulatory and splitting policy, cleared the way for the victory of fascism. Had it not been for the social democratism of Torradi and D'Aragona in Italy, the victory of the fascism of Mussolini would not have been possible. Had it not been for the social democratism of Ebert and Noske in Germany, the victory of the fascism of Hitler would not have been possible. Had it not been for the social democratism of Renner and Bauer in Austria, the victory of the fascism of Schusnig would not have been possible. Nothing can now conceal its truth, which is also irrefutably confirmed by numerous now well-known documents from the post-war political history of Europe. In the conditions of the unparalleled revolutionary crisis at the end of the imperialist war, the reactionary social democratic leaders split the working class, disarmed it ideologically and politically, hindered the development of the proletarian revolutions that had matured, saved the domination of capitalism, and thereby made the working people a target for fascism. At the same time, Bolshevism, true Marxism, united the working class, created an inviolable alliance of the workers and peasants, destroyed capitalism, ensured the victory of the socialist revolution, and led to the building of socialist society on one-sixth of the globe. And Comrade Stalin was a thousand times right when he wrote ten years ago that, quote, It is impossible to put an end to capitalism without having put an end to social democratism in the working class movement. Unquote. J. Stalin, Problems of Leninism, page 209, Russian edition. Herein lies the second most important lesson of principle for the proletariat of the capitalist countries in connection with the 20th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. 3. During the 20 years, the working masses in the capitalist countries, especially during the world economic crisis, experienced much, suffered much, and learned much on the basis of their own bitter experience. 
the final and irrevocable victory of socialism in the USSR on the one hand, and the lessons of the temporary defeats inflicted on the working class by fascism, especially in Germany on the other hand, have undermined the former influence of social democratism, not only in the working class, but also in the ranks of the socialist parties themselves and the trade unions under their political leadership. In the social democratic camp, there has begun a process of departure from the positions of reformism, of departure from the policy of class collaboration with the bourgeoisie, and of the transition to the position of struggle jointly with the Communist Party against fascism, to the position of united action of the working class and of the anti-fascist people's front. This process has already found clear expression in the establishment of the united front between the communists and socialists in France, Spain and Italy, and partly in a number of other countries. The further development of this process is being facilitated and speeded up by the entire course of the events of recent years, which imperatively faces the working class with the most important shock tasks of at all costs barring the road to fascism in the bourgeois democratic countries, of overthrowing fascism in the countries where it is in power, and of defending world peace against the fascist war makers. This process of the departure from social democratism is being speeded up by the correct application by the communist parties of the main lines laid down by the 7th Congress of the Communist International. As a result of the influence of the victory of socialism in the USSR, as a result of the development of the People's Front movement, of the growing influence of communism in the ranks of the working class movement, there will, without doubt, be an increase in the number of socialist parties and organizations which give up bankrupt social democratism, which wage a struggle together with the communist parties against the common class enemy and which stand for unity with the communists in a single mass party of the proletariat. Such a unification has already taken place between the socialists and communists of Catalonia. It is being prepared jointly by the communist and socialist parties of Spain. The necessary preconditions for it are also maturing in France as a result of the joint struggle of the communists and socialists in the United Confederation of Labour and in the ranks of the anti-fascist People's Front and also thanks to the beneficent influence exerted by the establishment of a united confederation of labor over the whole process of the consolidation of the forces of the French proletariat. The new pact between the Italian communists and socialists is still further strengthening their fraternal relations and the bonds of their joint struggle against the fascist dictatorship of Mussolini. Mutual understanding and accord are increasing between the communists and socialists in Germany in the struggle against the fascist dictatorship of Hitler, despite all the machinations and intrigues of the diehard leaders of the foreign executive of the Social Democratic Party. It may be said with confidence that by the 20th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution, the working class of the capitalist countries is closely approaching the liquidation of the split in the world working class movement which was brought into being by social democratism. There are still many difficulties and obstacles of an ideological, political and organizational character in the way of liquidating this split. There are difficulties connected with the very history and traditions of the working class movement in the different countries, difficulties which are not so easy to overcome. But the main thing is that the ruling classes of the capitalist countries, which are profoundly interested in the division of the forces of the working class movement, are doing and will continue to do everything possible to prevent the unity of the working class movement being established. For their benefit, the reactionary leaders of the Socialist International are expounding furious energy in order to turn back the wheel of history. Even in the fact of the monstrous Germano-Italian intervention in Spain, the ferocious onslaught by the Japanese fascist militarists on China, and the exceptionally acute menace of a new world imperialist war, these leaders are doing everything possible to wreck every attempt at joint action by the international organizations of the workers in defense of the Spanish and Chinese people, in defense of peace. But there are no such difficulties and obstacles on the path to unity in the struggle against fascism and war as the working classes cannot overcome if they are filled with the firm determination to unite their forces and fulfill their historic mission. The existence of the land of socialism, that powerful buttress of the struggle of the international proletariat, 
the buttress of peace, liberty and progress, is a tremendous factor in the liquidation of the split in the ranks of the world working class movement. By their example, their labor heroism, their Stahanov movement, their devotion to the socialist fatherland, their merciless struggle against the enemies of the people, Trotsky Buharinite spies, diversionists and agents of fascism, the working people of the Soviet Union exert enormous influence on the bringing together of the split forces of the world working class movement. The sympathy and love of the working people of the capitalist world for the Soviet Union, the land of victorious socialism, are steadily on the increase. And this fact acts as a most powerful antidote against the splitting work carried out in the ranks of the working class by the open and massed agents of the class enemy. The land of victorious socialism, which is playing such an outstanding part in uniting the international proletariat, is rallying all sincere supporters of the workers' cause, still more closely around the USSR. In the present international situation there is not, nor can there be, any other, more certain criterion than one's attitude towards the Soviet Union in determining who is the friend and who the enemy of the cause of the working class and socialism, of determining who is a supporter and who an opponent of democracy and peace. The touchstone in checking the sincerity and honesty of every individual active in the working class movement, of every working class party and organization of the working people, and of every democrat in the capitalist countries, is their attitude toward the great land of socialism. You cannot carry on a real struggle against fascism if you do not render all possible assistance in strengthening the most important buttress of this struggle, the Soviet Union. You cannot carry on a serious struggle against the fascist instigators of a new world bloodbath if you do not render undivided support to the USSR, a most important factor in the maintenance of international peace. You cannot carry on a real struggle for socialism in your country if you do not oppose the enemies of the Soviet state, where this socialism is being fulfilled by the heroic efforts of the working people. You cannot be a real friend of the USSR if you do not condemn its enemies, the trotsky Buharinite agents of fascism. The historical dividing line between the forces of fascism, war and capitalism on the one hand, and the forces of peace, democracy and socialism on the other hand, is in fact becoming the attitude toward the Soviet Union, and not the formal attitude toward the Soviet power and socialism in general, but the attitude to the Soviet Union, which has been carrying on a real existence for 20 years already, with its untiring struggle against enemies, with its dictatorship of the working class, and the Stalin constitution, with the leading role of the party of Lenin and Stalin. Herein lies the third most important lesson of principle for the proletariat of the capitalist countries in connection with the 20th anniversary of the great October Socialist Revolution.